There are two schools of thought relating to extraordinary extroversions of emotion. One school teaches that the individual should correct these things in himself and not burden society with them. The other school, which has a large following today, takes the ground that whatever we feel, we should say. If we don't like something, we should complain bitterly. And if we regard ourselves as injured or abused, we should retaliate in every way possible. This is sort of extroversion. A good example of it is the modern terrorist movements in various nations. They are the ones who feel that a complaint should be aired in its full um, meaning and dignity. This may be uh, a way that uh, appeals to persons who are not especially thoughtful, but I think that the wiser part of mankind has always explained the matter as something that should be worked over, contained, and transmuted within the life and character of the person himself. Now, there's no doubt in the world that the temptations to be unpleasant or unhappy are numerous. They are, so to say, initiations or tests. Our weaknesses are the primary reason why we're here, because, as the ancients certainly considered it, this world is a place of testing. It is a sphere in which we have the privilege of exhibiting the best of our own conduct and most of all the privilege of solving problems without unusual disturbance. Actually, to many folks, the problem of anger is one of those difficult pressures of the personality which are difficult indeed to transmute or to control. When we are unhappy or angry, critical, condemnatory, self-pitying, the whole of our libido flows into these attitudes. We seem to have no resistance to them. We feel as though a pressure greater than we can control, control is operating through us. And because of our psychological orientation, we feel that these pressures or this pressure is quite proper, reasonable, and appropriate to the situation. Usually when you discuss a problem of disposition with a person in difficulties, and he tells what he has done, and you explain that that was not the wisest way he could have handled a situation, he looks at you very innocently and says, well, I just can't help it. And most of our troubles, to a measure at least, come under the conviction that we just cannot help being ourselves. Now, it's somewhat difficult to assume that ourselves, in the best sense of the term, have bad dispositions. They do not. The internal life of man is sustained by law and order. The person themselves is never in a condition in which they cannot control their own feelings, that is, unless a distinct pathology exists. The real answer is that self-discipline is a tedious frustration of our feelings. We do not like to assume that it is our responsibility to act better than we feel. But the answer, of course, lies in the control of the way we feel and not a control of the tongue or of some external factor of communication. We have to realize also that all dispositional 
inconsistencies are penalized. No matter how we approach the situation, it becomes obvious that nature wishes us to have good dispositions. And if we fail to meet nature's wish in this matter, nature has a way of enforcing its attitude or its policy in, the, in connection with human life. The body itself, the physical body, is usually the primary victim of emotional intemperance. The body is damaged by any unreasonable, stressful, negative expression of emotion. Now, nature tells us in a very simple way that this damage is inevitable regardless of the motives which are impelling a wrong attitude. We may feel perfectly confident that our position is correct, but if our disposition is not under control, various after effects are very serious. For example, a person who has high blood pressure and a bad temper is compounding a difficulty. Under the stress of emotion, the high blood pressure can result in irreparable damage to the heart or the brain. The fact that the emotion seems to be justified does not prevent the damage. Nature, therefore, is not to be bribed uh, by some apology, by some personal interpretation of feelings which are contrary to natural law. The law of nature is very simple and direct. Human beings must live together in peace or perish. This is obvious on a political level. It is obvious in the psychological pressures of nations. And it is equally obvious in the home or within the actual physical structure of the human being. Nearly all of the discordant political factions that are disturbing us today feel that they have legitimate grievances. They have been wronged, injured, slighted sometime along the way of history. Sometimes the damage was done centuries ago. In other cases, it appears to be contemporary. But whatever be the historical background for the situation, the fact remains that any failure of internal composure is likely to thrust a major disaster upon mankind. Various attempts have been made to estimate the effect of emotional pressure on the individual. Delicate mechanisms are now available in which uh, these pressures can be recorded, estimated, and diagnosed. They also occur frequently in psychological counseling. And uh, a sincere and honest counselor realizes that he cannot change the disposition of another person. He can advise change. He can perhaps give some useful suggestions as to how this change can be accomplished. But if the person involved resolves not to change or lacks the strength of character to make a correction possible, the condition remains. So in this particular problem this morning, we wanted to handle or consider some of the personal factors. We can see the larger picture around us, where enmities, antagonisms, jealousies, mutually justified, uh, have carried us into the brink of a disaster. We must find the same situation within ourselves. It has been assumed with some validity that the average person is born with a good disposition. Small children are, for the most part, delightful little creatures. 
They live in a world of wonders beyond our comprehension. They have an internal life which is difficult for us to estimate or understand. Occasionally, uh, by nature, we will get a personality that is congenitally difficult. But for the most part, the small person is amenable to reason and wishes to live pleasantly and happily. What happens then to make this increasingly difficult? Obviously, the first immediate experience of the child is in the home. If the home is discordant, if the relatives are at swords points with each other, if the home contains a vast amount of complaint or one intensive complainer, this certainly works a serious hardship upon the child. The research indicates that under such circumstances, the child naturally and inevitably rises against discord. It is expressed through tears, sometimes by hysteria. It is also a reproachful attitude of the child toward those around it who are actually unpleasant. After a certain time, however, the child receives a series of disillusioning experiences. The child discovers that its effort to create peace is totally misunderstood. The contending persons may turn upon the child. Uh, they may punish the child for trying to arbitrate the difficulties of its parents. At the very best, the child is indoctrinated with the realization that these difficulties are inevitable, that the child growing up will face them also, and that there's no way of solving the problems except on some kind of an intellectual or emotional battlefield. By the time the child is fully indoctrinated with this concept, the character has already been damaged. It becomes adjusted to the inevitability of complaint, that the individual must complain his way through life. Also, it is witness to a gladiatorial combat of wills in which there is a tremendous battle of one mind against another. Sometimes this battle is very obvious, sometimes subtle. In some cases it is a sudden and spontaneous outburst, and in other cases it is a long, lingering determination to injure, damage, or in some way work a retribution upon another person. Starting out with this environment, we can see why the average individual does not develop in early life those resources which would protect it against the emergence of destructive feelings and attitudes from within himself. The beginning, naturally, is in the beginning of life itself. But the average person who is concerned with these matters is no longer in childhood. They are in midstream somewhere in the course of life. And they are mostly concerned with the inevitable discomforts which return to themselves and which they are not able to assimilate constructively. Once the person starts a line of criticism, or condemnation, the circumstances around them begin to be adversely affected. The individual against whom the attitude is directed retaliates, thus compounding a felony. Retaliation is also considered to be quite natural, quite normal, and almost inevitable. But it is on, only almost inevitable because the average individual is not developing the normal resources with which he has been endowed. It is inevitable for the person on the level of his own action to act differently from the way he reacts to circumstances. 
but it is always a privilege and an opportunity to rise to a better level by which these difficulties can be arbitrated successfully. So we have in all of this type of situation to consider with the greatest care how nature handles the matter. That's the first consideration. Nature is sometimes subtle, but usually rather obvious. Nature simply rewards the bad disposition with that type of circumstance to which it is properly entitled. In other words, it surrounds the individual with increasing difficulties arising from within the person himself, distributed through his environment, and reacting back upon himself. It seems, therefore, uh, that the dispositional factor is part of a vicious circle of consequences. If the person is constructive, well-intentioned, by nature kindly and thoughtful, he will gradually discover that this type of situation, this level of understanding, is in his environment as well as within himself. He stimulates good in others by using the good in himself. He stimulates discord in others uh, when he stimulates the discord in himself. Nature has set this up as the last and final a solution to all human problems, namely that the human being must grow or suffer. There is no excuse in nature. There is no real ability to prevent effects following their causes. And wherever an emotion is set in motion, the effect will be consistent with the emotion itself. A series of negative thoughts will not produce a positive end. A series of destructive attitudes will never lead to peace. A continual pressure of imm immaturity within the person will only accomplish maturity as a result of pain. <coughs> All these things being true, nature sets the stage. Nature tells us what we can do and has given us great codes of law and revelation to guide us in this search for internal integrity. We have the golden rule. We have the Sermon on the Mount. We are told in all religions to not only love our friends, but to do good to those who despitefully use us. This last part is not so frequently quoted. Because in, in many instances where the person claims to be devoutly religious, he never can quite get around to forgiving his enemy. If we go a little further into the matter and we recognize that this is the way that nature works, then we begin to study the forms of punishment, which nature affects uh, or inflicts upon those who disobey its rule. A bad disposition or lack of control nearly always becomes habit-forming. Very few individuals in the course of life have only one bad moment. These moments increase gradually as we permit them to dominate our attitudes. What it might be at first a brief hysteria or a sudden and dynamic conflict becomes a policy. Little by little, the whole mind not only nurses its grievances, but begins to look for more grievances. Not satisfied with the difficulties that it has, it goes out and discovers or invents further difficulties. By the time a person with a bad temper has indulged this for, say, 20, 30 years, it is no longer a person with a bad temper. 
It is a bad temper to which a person is appended. The temper becomes the important factor. It is the temper that becomes alive, and the person becomes only a servant of it. Go on, as we go along watching these procedures, we are forced to recognize that these intemperances begin to pile up and, and become policies in ourselves. I know cases of people who have come to me who admit under pressure that they have wrecked three homes with their own bad dispositions. They knew what caused it, or at least had a theoretical concept of it, but the new home went the same way. They were never able to actually vitalize remedy. They vitalized the difficulty, but never the solution. So we find that this, that anger, be, be, gets anger. It becomes more common. And the individual who tries to ex extrovert through this type of emotion finds that he is called upon to do so more and more frequently. And he can become an addict to his own disposition with dam damage to all concerned. Another problem that arises is the inevitable reaction of vibratory pressures within the person. Attitudes are rates of vibration by means of which the normal rhythms of the body are overdeveloped or depressed. The individual has a normal, proper heartbeat. If he is highly depressed, the heartbeat is afflicted. If he becomes excited, particularly destructively, the heartbeat is overstimulated. Now there are times and moments uh, when stimulation may be benevolent. The individual falling in love certainly passes through a strong emotional pressure. But this, uh, this pressure is supported by nature. It is part of a plan for things. It is not inordinate. It is controllable. It gradually subsides if it's excessive. It gradually builds up if it is not excessive until a normal point is reached. And in such con cases, the emotion being basically constructive, the consequences in the body are basically constructive. Nature de uh, deals out rewards and punishments on a merit system completely. On the side of the depressant person or of the uh, extrovert on negative situations, uh, the vibratory rates are confused, broken. The rhythms become uh, dissonant. And the individual's temper fit reminds one a little bit of one of our ultra-modern musical compositions. <laughs> it is noise, discourse, discord, a thunderous violation of the laws of harmony. This does not work any permanent good upon society. In fact, it is today one of the contributing forces towards the general demoralization of the younger generation. If music was harmonious, it would inspire. When it is dissonant, it definitely injures. When the emotions of the individual are constructive, then there is a kind of psychological or psychic music which is harmonious. But when the attitudes are frictional, dissonant, discordant, unrhythmic, then the consequences are damage and danger to the body. Now, the body may survive these dangers to a certain degree. Some people, more than perhaps we realize, come to a coronary through a bad outbreak of dispositional pressure. Others may gradually build up a certain immunity to this type of result, but it does not mean that they are not damaged. They are damaged in several ways, and nature has a kind of a analogy between the levels of thinking and the functions of the body. Every attitude seems to have a physical 
correspondent in our structure so that all attitudes have their physiological and anatomical analogies. This means that these attitudes affect various organs in various parts of the body according to the quality and type of reaction that has been stimulated. Uh, the ancients summed this up by dividing the body among the planets. And each planet had its keynote or keyword. And this planet bestowed certain virtues or powers upon man. And these virtues were distributed through the various corresponding organs of the body. As each planet has an, an emotional keynote, so the corresponding function in the body or organ, as the case may be, is either inspired or disturbed. If then we carry on certain negative attitudes, uh, we come in the end perhaps uh, to the final harvest, and that is in older years, one of two things is going to happen. The individual is either going to be sick or else he's going to be difficult to live with. Now if he's sick, he has had trouble living in with, with himself. If he is not physically sick, then he has trouble living with other people. And uh, it is more or less obvious that as the individual grows older, his petulances have a tendency to escape more and more from the control of his mind and his constructive attitudes. He has more tendency to drift back into habitual ways. If he has been a critic all his life, he will become a greater and more intensive critic as he grows older. If he, however, has lived a very gentle and kindly life, free from pressures, very often he drifts along through his closing years in a kind of pleasant fantasy in which the good he has done returns to him. This type of reaction is important. It's not so important to the teenager or the person in their early 20s, but the person who must live with the consequences of the effect of disposition upon function sometimes has a rather bad time of it. And uh, the, even under the best conditions, with the complete patience of other people, there is loneliness, there is a certain kind of isolation, uh, there is a failure of friendships, there is a, a more or less fatalistic sense of despair that arises as the consequence of living out an inadequate psychology of life. Now, one of the basic remedies, of course, for all of this is religion. Religion, by its own nature, is twofold, and we must try to understand that where religion is an inclusive uh, spiritual conviction that deals with principles and the proper manifestation of these principles. It is the most constructive force in the life of the person. If his religion, however, is in conflict, if he is more or less a religious fanatic, if he limits his spiritual viewpoint to some inadequate creed which demands nothing of himself except allegiance, he will then perhaps gain nothing and even lose some of the values he would naturally have. Religion in substance, then, gives the person a relationship with life. A truly religious person who believes in God cannot believe in violence. He may feel, of course, that in nature around him there is violence. But he must also realize that because within himself there is a divine principle, that it is not necessary that he accept violence as a way of life or permit it to emerge from himself as a way of character or living. Actually, faith in a divine principle of good has a strong tendency uh, to transmute the feelings of personal grievance. If God is in his heavens and the God in man is normally functioning, 
the individual has no need uh, to fall into despondencies or irritations or aggravations or recriminations. He has a right to recognize that there is a divine plan and religion is truly obedience to that plan and not membership in a sect. And if the religion says, love your neighbor, you love your neighbor. If religion says, love your enemy, you love your enemy. But usually at this point, the piety breaks down. The individual cannot resist the inclination to return evil for evil. As the old Greeks pointed out, an, a, an evil plus an evil equals two evils. They do not in any way neutralize each other. This being true, uh, the whole thing seems to come right back to the fact that we should sit down and say to ourselves, do I want to be happy? Had I rather be happy than miserable? Had I rather be loved than either feared or hated? I would rather be a good friend to my own family and to the families of others than a competitor, uh, one way or another, trying uh, to be a domestic politician. Would I rather have good health in which to enjoy my years, or would I prefer to see my health gradually disappear? And if I have good health, in spite of a bad disposition, do I want my life simply to be longer in order that I can have the bad disposition a little longer? These are decisions that each person has to make. They cannot be made by another. But nature gives us inspiration to make the constructive decisions. The poets, the philosophers, the mystics of all time have described in words and visions the good way of life. And in all instances, they have declared that the real way is peace. Peace in yourself. Peace on earth and goodwill to men. Goodwill to others is, of course, almost always under the pressure of anger. When we become angry, goodwill to others evaporates. And we live very largely for that triumphant moment when we have had a victory over an adversary. The people who win a negative debate sometimes have the most happy look on their faces that you can imagine. <laughs> The jaw sets a little bit, the eyes sparkle, and the individual has won a fencing match. What he has done to the other person is of no concern to him, because whatever they got out of it that wasn't pleasant, they deserved. But the victory won by violence is the same thing as a victory won by Napoleon or one of the other great conquerors. It is a victory floating for a moment on the surface of inevitable defeat, so that uh, there should be no satisfaction in the performance of a destructive action or the expression of a destructive attitude. Beginning then with the realization that probably most people, even after a long, uncertain life, want to make peace with themselves, make peace with their God, and live in harmony with their neighbor. These being the natural desires of the individual, it follows that every possible means should be used to see that these desires are nurtured and come finally to full expression. They should become the ruling uh, powers of life. Actually, also, that, that peculiar psychological entity within man, termed the soul, has a place in this. It has always been assumed that the soul is a principle of good, that the soul is the best and better part of the corporeal complex, 
the soul is the leaders is the leader of the bodies. It is the um, the herald that announces the glad tiding. The soul being by nature good and being a direct progeny of the divine good and all souls having their root in the soul of God in absolute benevolence. The soul in man wants peace. It wants love, friendship. It wants inspiration. It wants to expend itself in the common service of others. As in the case of the motto of the Prince of Wales, it din, I serve, is the motto of the soul. The soul wishes to give rather than to take. It wishes to help rather than to hinder. It wishes to devote its energies and powers to the improvement of all that lives, not the gratification of its own attitudes. The soul, therefore, is imprisoned <coughs> within the body of the person who acts contrary to it. The soul is deformed or degraded by abuse of its powers. And this uh, constant factor is present in what we might and often do like to regard as conscience. Conscience, as was, conscience, according to the ancients, was a name for the soul. It was that something inside of you that doesn't agree with you when you do not do right. And uh, it has been said in recent years that the con conscience is a small, still voice that gets smaller and stiller all the time. <laughs> but it is there. And there is not inevitably within the individual a tiny shock of some nature when he makes a serious abuse of his own uh, abilities. Something inside of the individual tells him to do right. But usually the inner voice is not more successful than the legislative structure of the environment. The individual still does what he pleases. The answer to this, of course, is that he must please to do that which is right. He must have a pleasure in peace instead of finding satisfaction in discord. To build such a concept in himself requires a considerable amount of self-control. It requires also sometimes a little bit of fear. Fear is not a good emotion in itself, but an anxiety concerning the state of self is sometimes benevolent. When a person begins to realize that what he is doing is getting him into increasing difficulties, and he proceeds along the way, certain anxieties arise within him. He likes to push these anxieties away, always transferring responsibility to something or someone else. But in the course of time, when the mysterious ills which he has fashioned come back upon himself, he is subject to anxiety. He wishes to find a solution. He is like an alcoholic who has finally discovered that he has a habit that is killing him. Now, an alcoholic who makes this discovery either kills himself because he says he cannot change, or perhaps with the la last flash of integrity in himself, joins Alcoholics Anonymous or some other similar group and tries desperately with the cooperation of other people to restore his own self-dignity. Now, alcohol, narcotics, things of these kinds are recognized dangers, but it is not realized usually the disposition is just as dangerous as a narcotics addiction. Unless it can be tempered and educated, things do not go well. Education doesn't seem to help this situation. The child coming out into the world is taught conflict. He is taught 
that if it does not fight its way, it won't get there. It is taught to view a competitor as an enemy. Gradually, it also learns that laws, as they are enforced in society, are enemies because they interfere with his doing exactly as he pleases. So various resentments set in, and instead of realizing that he should be obedient, he glorifies disobedience, making it a symbol of individual achievement. Having reached the point where he cares about nothing but himself, he regards his career as well on its way to success. This type of thinking is not being corrected. The philosophical systems of the past that had much to do with this are no longer active. Most philosophy is now dominated by do-what-you-please attitudes. Philosophy is the justification of our mistakes rather than an inspiration toward the correction of them. So the academic systems of today make bad matters worse. And by the time the person goes out into life to assume the responsibilities of living, he goes as a lamb to the slaughter. He goes full of false notions which he tries to live up to. He goes into a conflict with those around him. He has a wrong interpretation of marriage and a wrong interpretation of parental responsibility. He is living forever to do as he pleases. But life that is valuable is not a life of infinite opportunity alone, but a life of continuing responsibility. Very often dispositions resent responsibility. They do not want to curtail the satisfaction of their personal attitudes or the continuance of dominant habits. But unless these are controlled, unless these are corrected, life is not going to be successful. How we can work with this problem, wherever it shows up, uh, is almost always an internal experience. There are many cases, for example, where an agnostic or a person with very little religious background has become variously dominated by a strong religious experience. The transforming power of a mystical experience is difficult to overestimate. The individual having a flash of light from within his own soul, very often can change and mend his ways. Some of the greatest saints in the hagiology were among the most prominent sinners of their time. But something happened. Now, what happens usually is a head-on collision with tragedy. It is something by which the individual, going along his way, selfish and thoughtless and careless, suddenly confronts an issue that moves him to his very foundations. Something that he cannot cope with by the shallow thinking or feeling that he has had during life. An example of this is the case of a very nagging couple in which the nagging went so far that one member of the team uh, took the attitude that they were completely empowered to dominate the life of the other. Then suddenly the dominated person died. This was a very critical moment because the survivor did care for that person who passed on but began more and more obsessed with the belief that they were responsible for his death. They looked back upon all the nagging, unpleasant things they had done. They came to me and told me of the selfishness which had dominated their relationship. This survivor was the one who always got their own way and was thoughtless, and that when the deceased was ill, They assumed it was imagination and would not even have proper medical care. The other person had to be wrong. Then suddenly the other person left. 
and the whole weight of many years of wrong relationships fell upon the survivor. The result was cataclysmic. From that time on, the survivor tried in every way possible to make amends. They could not do anything for the one who was gone, but they tried to live a better life in memory and honor of that person who was gone. And they became a very valuable uh, servant of society, making many, many important contributions to common good and welfare. This was the, uh, the startling, the critical experience. A man who had been up to his eyebrows in economics, who lived with the Wall Street Journal, and who had a ticket tape machine in his home at a coronary. While in a state of uncertainty as to whether he was going to survive or not, he did not read the Wall Street Journal. He didn't care. It meant nothing to him. He had no longer any direct relationship with his worldly goods because it was dawning upon him that he might be departing from them at any moment. He recovered, and when he recovered, he began to read the Wall Street Journal again. But from that time on, he never recognized physical success as the most important thing in the world. His approach to death assisted him to a reorganization of his own internal life. It caused him to realize that the things that were important he had neglected to that which he could not take with him when he went. He became a better husband, a better father, a better friend and was much more generous and moderate in his attitudes on business matters. So disaster, crisis, conflict of a very difficult nature is often the great awakener. Also, the discovery within self of progressive infirmities have a tendency to change our attitudes. When it becomes obvious that what we have been doing is endangering survival, physical survival, then we have a physical reform, at least a strong incentive to improve the situation. A man goes to his physician, and the physician says to him, uh, you have to change your way of life. You have to give up drinking. You have to be more moderate in all your attitudes or you won't make it. This individual now has the most powerful incentive in the world to curb his physical attitudes or his appetites. But what does he have uh, in the form of an inducement to change his internal emotional relationships with life? He has exactly the same uh, diagnosis on that level. A very skillful and informed mental therapist will tell him that what of his emotions are destroying him. Will tell him how he must change or else physically, emotionally, or mentally break down. He can be given some help and inducement, even temporary medical assistance. But this is not, uh, not solutional. The solution lies in the individual. The only thing medication can do is to give him a temporary relief to help him to have the time and courage to make the necessary enduring adjustments. So if uh, you find that you are unable to handle uh, the problems of living, and we're going to have a nice example of this and a really almost initiation into the situation next year when we have elections. Now, elections are something that no one really is able to rationalize. They happen. Sometimes more or less equivalent to earthquakes, sometimes equivalent to fires, 
often con uh, 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 similar to pestilences, but they happen. And the average individual has no real ability uh, to equate the values. But next year, more people who did not know that others existed are going to hate them than any before in the last four years. We are going to be mad, excited, damaged. We are going to be insulted by one candidate's program. We are going to be exhilarated by another candidate's program. Yet the soul inside of us tells it won't make any difference anyway. <laughs> but we won't accept it. And if we have an edgy disposition, subject to temper fits or anger, we are really going to extrovert them, these dispositions. We are going to hate people we never heard of before. And we are going to like people who aren't worth anything. We are going to try to decide, finally, by the one estimation, which is the basic fallacy, we're going to try to pick the one who is most likely to be useful to advance our own personal objectives. If we want to have larger wages, we're going to vote for a labor advocate. If we want lower wages, we're going to vote for the more conservative person. Not because he's better or worse, but because of his relationship to our own pattern of living. Now, with, with all this anger coming along, fed nourished by world anger and world confusion, individuals are going to subject themselves to what might be termed a political epidemic. The uh, various situations are going to stir people up, are going to make neighbors strangers to each other, and make strangers with nothing in common uh, neighbors, in a sense. We're going to have all kinds of excessive reactions. We are going to feel in ourselves we know what all of these different candidates should be doing. Then we're going to go into a despair because we can't make them do it. It's going to be a time for great emotional stress. It's going to be all kinds of fire and thunder accomplishing nothing. If you have a naturally edgy disposition, you may well work yourself into a bad illness over this type of thing. You may also make remarks you will regret the rest of your life because you do not have the composure to sit down quietly. You do not have the natural inclination to try to study the needs and are going to vote according to the journalists, the columnists, or the television reporters. We are going to find also that party lines become more important than principles, and the individual who is immature in himself is going to have a Roman holiday with his own weaknesses. Now, there's no need for this, and it will save a great deal of wear and tear if we begin to moderate all attitudes. A matter of who is going to run something is really not a matter for riots. It is a matter for very deep, quiet consideration of values. The individual who is constantly parading has not considered the values adequately, or he wouldn't have time to parade. And if he thinks deeply enough, he might have difficulty in finding any cause to parade with. But on the surface, all these things become dramatic. And they also become definitely psychotic. But assuming we live through this uh, with fair chance, uh, we come back again to the individual. Every one of these pressures, personal, collective, are shocks. They are periods of tremendous crisis in the emotional life. So I think it would be very good for the person who has this type of t attitude and is always wanting to do something uh, strenuous, should begin to rechannel his own resources. You cannot serve two masters at the same time. 
You cannot serve your own weaknesses. At the same time, you are performing constructive actions. Therefore, anyone who is too much alone, which often contributes uh, to anger or melancholy, or is too one-pointed in their objectives so that anything that is done not in agreement with them, in agreement with them, becomes an enemy, should find other constructive channels through which they can express their feelings uh, in a happier and more benevolent way. Speaking of the reaction of feelings, however, for many years, Japanese industry has had a very interesting attitude on this subject. In nearly all large industrial organizations, there is room set aside for grievances. In this room, which is sparsely furnished, probably only a chair, hangs one of these punching bags that is used in athletics, one of these dummy type of things which the football player learns to tackle. It is suspended from the ceiling. If you're unhappy, you're mad, you have grievances against the boss, if you think the business is unfair and that you have not been given the promotions you deserve, you go in there, close the door, and punch the bag who becomes the person you don't like. The boss is the bag. So you punch it and fight it and you talk about it and you scream and you shout at it. And while you do it in that room, there is no penalty. There is not held against you. So you get it out of your system and go back to work. This is a quite a cute psychological idea that's proved very successful. Now, when you feel some kind of attention coming into your life that you don't know how to handle, you might enter that little room which the Bible calls the closet. And there you fight it out with yourself. Instead of fighting it out with someone else, you fight it out with the boss who is unfair. And that boss who is unfair is yourself. It is your will, determination to accomplish regardless of cost or consequence. It is ambition, which you're going to justify if it kills you and everybody else. It is revenge, for which you live for, and which you cannot endure giving up. It's retaliation, or perhaps it's just the simple case of giving other people a piece of your mind, which is usually a very small piece. <laughs> so you go into yourself, and you settle down quietly and fight it out with yourself. Now, you're going to find when you do that, however, that the battle is not as complicated as it seems, because in the, the self in you, the spiritual overself is not going to fight. You can batter it around as much as you want to. It simply remains there. It's like the little Zen figure of Daruma, the little, the little weight that no matter how often you tip it over, always bounces back. The, the adversary does not, in this case, does not retaliate. It lets you fight it out until you gradually come to realize that you are fighting a shadow, that the thing that you are fighting you cannot win. It is something too deep, too mysterious, too powerful. It is something that with one slight stroke can kill you. For if that heart which is dependent upon life stops you through, regardless of all the controversies you may have, you must leave all your grievances and all your antagonisms behind you, even though you try to perpetuate them in your last will and testament. <laughs> Actually, when you get in there and work it out with yourself, you punch a few times at your own inner self, and then you get a little tired. And finally, you do what everyone has to do. You give up yourself and get back in line with the truth. It's, a, it's a maybe not a perfect analogy, but it has its points. Actually, inside of yourself, it has to be worked out. And there are all kinds of ways of working it out. All of them requiring one essential value. 
getting your mind off of yourself. Stop cuddling by using the mind forever to justify your own action. Get your mind working on useful and constructive matters. Instead of regretting the past, build for the future. Instead of damaging the present, improve it. Realizing always that the decision is with you. If you once find uh, it useful, you will discover also that most people cannot live successfully in solitude. Most people cannot afford to be alone with themselves too long. The ability to be alone with yourself happy and well-adjusted is one of the highest levels of philosophical insight, and very few persons have achieved it. To live at peace with yourself means that you must be living in a self that is peaceful. Until that time, when you can really achieve such a dramatic, uh, important change in yourself, it is better to channel uh, the energy which is used for grievances into other channels of activity. It means broaden the horizon, broaden the foundation of your life, increase your interests, find new positive dedications, in this way, relieving t stress without damage. The energy behind a temper fit, if properly trained, might make a beautiful painting, or it might compose a great piece of music, or it might go out and help someone who is sick. The energy that used destructively is the cause of karma. The misuse of the divine power to give life adds desperately to the burden of our indebtedness to life. There are many ways, they don't all have to be great altruistic achievements, but they can be constructive. Study, self-improvement, hobbies, avocational interests, travel, or gradually the development of some specialized personal skill. All of these have a tendency to create a new attitude toward life. The book collector who has been searching for 20 years to find a certain volume has been sustained not by the fact that he hated the volume, but that he longed for it. And if at the end of his search he attains it and he secures it, he is happy. Now, this is a very simple way of being happy. You don't have to have quite such a difficult volume to find, but you can be happy by the achievement of some constructive, pleasant, creative, inspiring end that brings with it a tangible and more or less immediate reward. You can do, de dedicate your future, therefore, to an achievement rather than an endurance. You can stop at any moment and turn the energy which you have away from all destructive outlets. After all, the energy with which we knock a man down is also the energy by which we must lift him up. Whatever energy we use has its positive and negative aspects. All negative aspects injure everything involved. All the constructive aspects advance causes of life on many, many different levels. Uh, we know a number of older people who have formed groups for various purposes. Some of them charitable. Some have gone into hospitalization as helpers. Some have become tutors of children, teachers of music. Some have had the tremendous experience that Anne Sullivan had when she brought Helen Keller out of darkness into light. These were great dedications. And in the case of Helen Keller, it was a very outstanding example because the completely locked child was almost impossible. Disposition incredible. Locked away from everything, light, darkness, everything. And yet under the care of a dedicated person, 
Helen Keller responded and became one of the most dedicated women of her time and a tremendous inspiration to other people. If uh, Ann Sullivan had turned when Helen struck her, knocked her down, screamed at her, turned away with resentment, she might have found a little temporary satisfaction, but she lived to have the greatest satisfaction a person can have, the bringing of life into light. So whenever we create antagonisms, we simply deprive ourselves of something. When we perpetuate these feelings, we perpetuate the impoverishment of ourselves. So everywhere where fear, worry, anxiety, doubt, uh, all these ang and anger, anguish, egotism, overambition, frustration, wherever any of these emotions exist, there is an energy crying out to be used constructively. You put to work to do something that makes life better. If you use it that way, someday you will receive the reaction. Something that you have done will become a great consolation to you, a great source of internal realization of achievement in the name of truth. So we have to start by an energy equivalent. Now we have energy equivalents in nature. One of the most problemed one at the moment is our petroleum industry. We have been gradually exhausting the supply of petroleum in this earth, which is really a bottle made up of a number of contents. Someday we're going to empty the bottle. But in the meantime, we have wasted this product. We have refused to control the use of it. We have placed our own pleasure and our own comfort above the preservation of an essential natural resource. One of these days we're going to be without it. But even this has its answer. For being without it, we are going to be forced to make adjustments. And these adjustments are not going to be pleasant. It would have been much happier for all concerned if we had anticipated the problem and solved it. Now, in the human being, we have energy. Man is the only creature in nature with mind and renewable energy. Uh, other forms of life, like growing plants and so forth, have renewable, renewable energy, but not intelligence renewable energy. We have it. And the, one of the most important things in life is to find out how to use that energy. It is limited, but it is renewable. And during the course of life, this energy principle is handed down from one generation to another to maintain the works of the world. This energy is our greatest natural resource in ourselves. If we continue to waste it, doing exactly as we please and contrary to common sense, we, dis we exhaust it in ourselves, and when energy fails, we end. Therefore, the conservation of energy in itself is the greatest possible in, uh, inducement uh, to the regulation of attitudes. It takes just as much energy to have a temper fit as it would take to perform a great constructive action. We have to use this energy, but if we abuse it and depreciate it and exhaust it, we become lacking in energy, and then all the projects of life become a burden and a responsibility. So we have to conserve the energy while we have it. We have to use it as wisely as we can, and we must dedicate that use to the divine power which provided the energy in the first place. We are living off of the life of God. We are living in the life of God. And this life, which we so superficially use, is really a divine endowment. It is something put in us for our salvation, and too many of us use it for our destruction. All of these things tell us 
that blessed is peace of mind, quietude, dedication. It is not that the individual shall do nothing. It is not that he should run away from life because it has hurt him. It is not that he should move out of the house because the family is uncongenial. It is that the individual, in his own positive way, makes peace with life and recognizes the importance of using life in society, not to go off into a hole somewhere and try to get along with yourself, which is usually about as difficult as getting along with other people. Actually, the real answer is to take the energy which was intended for a constructive use and put it to that constructive use. Everywhere there is need. Everywhere today people are under stress and strain. Many are comparatively uh, futile as far as solving their problems are concerned. Others live almost daily in tragedy. But and, and in a case like that, no human being can afford to waste life in a temper pit. There is much more to be done. There is a, an opportunity, and there is always the full realization that our own crises, our own complex situations, are intended to bring us to the realization of our responsibilities. We are not to be muscle-bound trying to control ourselves. We are rather going to express ourselves on a constructive level. We are going to do that which is necessary for our own good and the common good. For if we dis betray the common good, we will ultimately betray our own. We are going to do what is necessary to perpetuate and maintain the progress of the human purpose. We are here to perfect something and not to abuse it. We are here to realize ultimately the absolute unity of life, that we are not only each other's brothers, we are essentially and primarily one being. Our brother is ourself in another body. The stranger is ourself in another body. Our enemy is ourself in another body. And by gradually coming to this realization, we overcome the divisional factors of illusion within ourselves. It doesn't mean that we all have to go out and agree with everyone we disagree with. Far from it. But we must agree with the truth within ourselves. And if we do this, we cannot have too much conflict with others. Being that if we cannot do something to help a person to be better, then we will quietly retire and let someone else help him. If we are not able to be friendly and companionable, we will bless the stranger, but we will never, in any case, argue or fight with him. If he has to go his way, that is up to him. But we will never add spark to a flame, and we will never stir a fire with a sword. If we, ne if we recognize these truths, we can quietly, in general, solve most of the dispositional problems of our living. We can become more friendly, and we can become more optimistic. For every time we find something good in life, it adds to our apt optimism. Whenever we are disillusioned about something else, it contributes to our pessimism. Pessimism is not our way. It is not the way of heaven. The proper way for the individual is through his own gradually unfolding consciousness to see something a little better every day and become increasingly aware of the infinite availability of the good, the good being that which should cause rejoicing to the spirit. While we nurse our weaknesses, there will be no rejoicing. But when we give the best part of ourselves leadership over the rest, then we will live in the light as it is intended that we should. Man is a wonderful creature. 
selling himself short. He is capable of magnificence and is satisfied with mediocrity. He is capable of infinite forgiveness. And so he goes on year after year nursing a grudge. All of these are misuses of the human being himself. And nature will not endorse misuse. Nature is maybe patient, but in the long run, man will do what he was intended to do. And as one wise man said at one time, the difference between a philosopher and a fool is simply this. A fool is forced by universal procedures to accomplish that against his will, which the philosopher already enjoys and has achieved. In other words, the foolish person must do what the wise person glories in doing. Under those conditions, we can make some changes, and now is the appropriate moment because there is never a time while there is still breath within us that we cannot gradually a limit, a little, uh, eliminate a little acidosis from the circulatory system. We can do better. We can sleep better, live better, have a greater optimism and a greater usefulness, and find more and more from within ourselves the reason why we are here in the first place. If this type of thinking... Uh, is developed a little bit, and the older person especially usually has plenty of time to develop it. If it is developed, strengthened, and put to work, not only will the complainers be less numerous, but many whose complaints have alienated them will find that they are welcomed back into the family of good nature. If this achieves its end, the lonely will no longer be alone, but will be bound together, not by responsibilities, duties, and obligations, but by the very simple and gentle power of love. When we get to be lovable, we're loved. When we're not lovable, we're not loved. But everyone can be lovable. Thank you very much, folks.